get going. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the grand finale of the Friday SLO talk. My name is Yarek Yanyu. I'm the Outcomes Assessment Coordinator from Santa Ana College in Southern California. And I have a great pleasure to welcome uh, the panelists and uh, the coaches group, the people who have made it all happen. There are coordinators from community colleges in Southern California, not only Southern California, in California. And um, we've been very hard at work to make this, this, this uh, event happen. And I will just uh, let them introduce themselves. Uh, Enrique, could we start with you, please? Good morning. My name is Enrique Jauregui. I'm the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College in the Central Valley. And Amanda, please. Hi, Amanda Tainter. I am from Enrique's sister school, Reedley College in the Central Valley, and I am the outcomes coordinator here. Hello, Grace. Hi, everyone. I'm Grace Estrada, and I'm the SLO coordinator at Evergreen Valley College in San Jose, California. So again, I just 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 my great appreciation to to to, to my colleagues uh, for making this all happen. Uh, really, really appreciate you guys. This this has been fantastic collaboration effort. And now, uh, without further ado, let's introduce our our panelists. Um, Michelle Dunbar from uh, California State University, Dominguez Hills. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Michelle is here because she is an assessment specialist, and as you know. For those of you who are in Southern California, a lot, a lot, a lot of students who are leading community colleges do progress to Cal State system. So welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Then we have Cheryl Ashenbach, who is the secretary for Academic Senate uh, for Co California Community Colleges. As always, great, grateful for your support over the years. Cheryl, I tell you, I, I, just, I just appreciate your engagement. You're, you're, you're always helpful hand, you're, you're, you're always uh, respond, uh, re re ready to go to respond to, 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 to our demands, your, your, your help and your guidance. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Then we have uh, Natasha Yankovsky, of course, the former director of NILOA. I, I tell you, I've been reading Natasha's papers since about 2010, I wanna say, so it's been a while. <laughs> And I do remember early days when I tried to find out what student learning outcomes are all about. One o'clock in the morning, I'm still reading this Yankovsky paper, you know, I'm still doing it. So 10 years later, we are still at the, going through, through Niloa website and other publications. So thank you again, Natasha, for your ongoing uh, support and, 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 and work on this. And last but not least, Brian Alexander, whenever he checks in, I hope I'm going to see him. It can, did anybody see Brian yet? He's here. He's here, Brian is there, right on. Thank you, Brian, for joining us. If you haven't seen Brian's um, YouTube channel, please do check it out. I, I you haven't said that to Brian, but, but I tell you, I uh, put on his podcast on YouTube and I listen to it when my son is swimming. I work, walk around the high school track listening to uh, his fantastic guests uh, that he's inviting uh, pretty much on a weekly basis, right, Brian? Uh, indeed, every Thursday at 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, so there it is. Uh, he, so, so Brian, you've been, you've been a great inspiration, just so that you know, for me, in, in, in many of the, uh, my, my, my thinking about the assessment of student learning competency and all those things that have to do with, with student learning. So thank you very much for your guidance. You uh, and here we are. Words. And to be honest, this, this is an idea that I, that I uh, stole from, from Gra uh, Brian. Uh, I, I, I did modify it a little bit, but uh, I would like the, the panelists, uh, perhaps starting, starting with Cheryl, Cheryl, then Michelle, Brian, and then Natasha, if you could please um, introduce yourself by saying uh, what it is that, that attracts you to the topic of student learning. Why do you think it's a topic that's, that's of importance to you personally in your professional life? Uh, how, why, why are you here? Why do you think you have something to say? What would be the immediate scope of your interest of that, uh, on, on, of, 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 of that topic? Could we do introduction that way? Cheryl, would that work for you? Yeah, sure, Yark. And hi, everybody. It's, it's uh, incredible to see folks internationally even. So, uh, so uh, happy to be joining you in the space. And, and I say that every time, and I'm, I'm really authentic about that. I mean it. Um, student learning, I, I went into teaching because I want to see people learn. Uh, I started my career uh, in physical education and, and sport, 
And it was about how can we take what they're learning and make sure that it turns into the, the performance they need on a competition day um, or in fitness and health. And as I moved through my career from junior high and, and now community college teaching English and public speaking, it, I constantly engaging uh, as a practitioner into what are my students learning? Are they, are they learning what I intend to them to learn? How am I assessing that? And I had the questions in the quick quote that Yark uh, requested, but really teaching and learning is my passion. And uh, we can't talk about student learning if we're not talking about how to assess student learning. And um, you know, Yark speaking about the wealth of resources out there, including Brian and Natasha is like, you know, really drawing on those resources and expanding my, my interest in assessment far beyond just what happens in my classroom uh, to what happens on our campuses and, and viewing our campuses as an entire learning space. So that's really my origin. I, I love to teach, but I even more so love to, to facilitate. I, and I really see it as that uh, student learning growth and, and preparation for, for workforce and society. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Michelle, you're next. <laughs> Great, thanks. So happy to be here, everyone. Um, well, I'm a sociologist by training. So I look at things in a very broad sense, um, I would say. And education is um, just one of my passions in terms of the effect it can have on society. And in my work as a sociologist, I'm very involved in looking at the macro and the micro, so the interactions between the two. And I think assessment is a space that falls into that. So the learning that happens individually in the classroom with the students is so important. But structurally speaking, when we put programs together, you know, we cobble together these courses, we make a program and then we make a degree or a certificate program. Um, you know, that, 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 that group of learning outcomes, program learning outcomes that we're working on and those higher level um, pieces that we're, we're pulling together. I'm, I, I love, that's what I love about assessment, getting to work on sort of all of those levels. And the work I do right now is an integrated assessment of our first year experience program. So that's also not just academic, um, learning inside the classroom, but the co-curricular and how we support students to be successful so that, you know, they stay, they have a sense of belonging, they stay and persist, um, maybe finish their, you know, community college degree and move on and so forth and, and help them in the larger sense for that upward mobility in society to get a degree, to get a better job, to, um, you know, to better their lives. So that's what makes me excited about it and why I enjoy doing it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Michelle, indeed, uh, John Dewey was the one who said that education is a function of the society. So I'm, I'm sure that we are all sociologists at heart. So thank you very much for uh, bringing that, 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 that perspective uh, to our discussion. Uh, Brian Alexander, you're next on the slide. Please do tell us what, what, what attracts you to the topic of, of, of student learning. Well, sure. First of all, can you hear me all right? Absolutely. Very good. Uh, so greetings from uh, somewhere on the Mass on the Maryland, Pennsylvania border right now. Uh, I've been uh, interested in this for two big reasons. One is as a teacher, uh, teaching uh, writing and teaching literature and new media studies dating back to the 1990s. And I was always, always passionate about that. Uh, very evangelical, in fact, trying to get students to appreciate and learn all these wonderful materials. Uh, but I think more recently, talking to the panel in a small way, I'm very interested in how humanity is learning right now, how we are learning to rethink our civilization, ways of life, how we confront the climate crisis and other major, major crises, how we are rethinking our power systems, how we're rethinking our food systems, how we are rethinking what we, how we view success in life and politics. Uh, and I think higher education has a huge role to play in that. So I'm really, really fascinated by this kind of species-wide learning and relearning that's going on right now. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, for that introduction. That's fascinating. And I'm really happy to hear this link with what, what Cheryl just mentioned, right? That teaching is at the heart of everything that we do. We, we are concerned. We are focused on our student learning. The question that we are all going to be trying to, ascend, uh, to answer today would be what it is that we mean by student learning or, or what it means to assess it. Um, again, thank you very much, Brian. Um, really appreciate you having, uh, having you here. Um, the next one is Natasha, last but not least. Good morning. Good morning and hello everyone and to your different times and happy driving, Brian. Lovely to, to hear you and, and get you on here. I love the focus of thinking about teaching and society and humanity and the role that all of these things play in the systems that we create. And for me, 
getting into this work. So my background was in philosophy and I got into assessment and from a space of really saying things that are complex, that's okay. And we shouldn't try to make things that are inherently complex with huge impacts that are potential to students, to society, to our educational structures simpler than they need to be, that we need to have that space to reflect, that we need to have that space to think deeply. And so one of the things that I wanted to do in coming into the assessment space is I see it as so important and interlinking to all of the work we do to our students, to our structures, to our ongoing learning as we participate in um, society and democracy and all those pieces. And so the things that we do in assessment, if we don't get it right here, we can't expect to see these ripple effects elsewhere. And so I really wanted to come into to the space of assessment to be a good partner, to help us think more deeply about our work. And yes, there are process steps that we do, but why? And what are the implications for those steps and what are the different context pieces we need to think about so that we're being very mindful of the, the maneuvers that we make as we teach and we engage um, and as our students learn and reflect on that learning. And so very happy to be here um, with, with great colleagues to be in dialogue and looking forward to our conversation today. Right on. Thank you very much, Natasha. So what we have um, prepared for you is, um, again, collaborating with my colleagues and sending emails to other coordinators. We came up with a number of questions for you, uh, topics for discussion. Uh, we have them here on our, on our slide deck, and we'll just move through them as, as prompts for the discussion. Um, audience, just so that you know, you're more than welcome to raise your hand. Uh, Write your comments in the chat. Please let us know if you have any, any questions, comments, uh, suggestions of any kind. Don't hesitate to speak up. Uh, we'll, we'll let you speak or you can, you can just type things in the, in the chat and, and one of us is going to pick them up to make sure that your voices are heard. Without further ado, good morning again, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, coordinators. Um, Amanda, I believe that the, the first slide is yours. It, it, Thank you. It is. And um, we're going to start out with some really light questions for you to get down to. Um, and I'm going to take a lot of creative license as I read through these, but it's basically these three um, premises. And, and it boils down to um, why we're all here. If, if the current grading system of grading and promoting um, graduating students, why isn't that sufficient? Um, why do we care about student learning? Why is the learning part important? Why isn't it just, yay, we have graduation rates. Why are we focusing on that learning piece? And if it's so important to us, um, like I'm sure most of us share that sentiment, why haven't we moved our discussion beyond just looking at it through an accreditation demand, um, um, checking that, that box? So those are your very simple questions to get us started off with. And I don't know, Yark, if you had planned on going through or just you know whatever panelist wants to to attack it first i i think so we'll we'll, we'll just write oh michelle looks like she is Thank ready you. to go <laughs> please well i was thinking um as you were reading through these as usual we really are higher ed in general i think is so reactive that it is being prompted by not enough people showing up at graduate being there to graduate really let's be honest so first the accreditation push that's always been there that mandated you know carrot stick kind of thing. But where we've really, other than that, I think pushed assessment, it's because students are not, you know, staying and they're not persisting to graduation. And that's, and I hate to be, to sound, <laughs> you know, uh, cynical, I guess, but it's also like the bottom line. Yes, we're, you know, education is nonprofits, but it's also that business model to stay open. We have to have, you know, people enrolled and people graduate, all of that stuff, it still goes to the business model. So, I, unfortunately, that's where the push is, but I mean, at least we're there and now, but I think that's why we haven't moved yet uh, into, you know, everyone really truly embracing it because it has been such a reactionary push, um, even with, with the fact that it's been re required for accreditation purposes. In that case, it's always been, okay, well, we do it when we need to for whatever years, you know, and we wait and then when we have to do it again for our self-studies that we have to submit to get reaccredited we do it again so that's sort of the context historically of it and why i think it's still challenging to get everyone on board um so just to i don't know throw that out there as an opener i can pick uh, up I'll on that i'll oh, jump in and follow that if i can natasha or if you want go for it no you get it cheryl i got your back go for it all right awesome um I, i'm just thinking when we think about grading promoting and and, and graduating students uh, those are easy numbers to collect, and, and we look at the data, and people can understand that. Um, I think what's lost, especially coming from the community college system, 
is that a lot of our students don't need to graduate. And yet that's a marker that's established for that continued funding. And that's where I think we, we fall short. If the conversation really is about learning and students on the, on the way to that completion, whether it's a certificate or degree, learn what they need to take those skills into the workforce, we should be celebrating that much more than we already do. And I know that's a different conversation at the university level, but at the community college, I think we often overlook that. Um, and, and we do, we look at what our, our CTE outcomes are, we look at you know placement and, and employment, but I don't think it's still looking enough at and valuing enough the conversations around learning. When we talk about why is it important and why aren't we doing it more, it, it's about moving from that micro to a little bit more institutional macro level about um, what are students learning and you know how are we trying to get them to that next step. We know even within our, our we all have great conversations with our, ourselves, I assume, at least we like to think so. Uh, and then you rope in a couple of colleagues from down the hall who are teaching in your discipline and have a conversation about learning. Uh, but it's harder to often go and have really meaningful conversations beyond that. We have spaces like this, which are valuable, but on our campuses, we don't always make enough room, enough time and to really demonstrate the value of those conversations. So I think that's part of just the complexity and the time and the thought that we need to go deeper into those conversations at a, at a larger uh, institutional level is part of why we're not moving beyond that simple data of let's graduate students and celebrate that. That's a, these are both great points. And I think it picks up one of those things on important to whom, right? And so when we think about why is assessment of student learning important to students, it's because of how students move through our educational system. If they come for a course, if they come for this one learning experience, I need to be really clear on what I got from that. I need to be able to talk about what I can do with that experience and then move somewhere else. If we think about it more from an institutional perspective, then you start to get into some of these things. Well, I want to see a longer arc. I want to see these graduations. And we think about which type of institution or am I trying to make an external argument to stakeholders where I'm proof valuing? I'm talking about, look at this. We do these things. Do so we have value in this space? And I think it becomes very different, our focus and our perspective and, and, and how we're sharing on it. But it's really hard to move beyond a lot of these assessment and accreditation discussions because we have this you know, terrible history of it started with like state mandates. And we still have a ton of state mandates. I mean, California, you understand. And, and then in accreditation, you have all of these things that you need to report, some of which the meaningful work that we're doing is considered valuable evidence and some of which isn't. And moving that between um, administration structures that still say, this is coming, we're going to use sticks and continue doing what you're doing in meaningful teaching and engaging with students and providing these wonderful student experiences, but don't talk about that to this other audience. <laughs> but here comes this stick. We end up tying our hands in these very difficult ways that keeps this tension moving. Um, and as much as accrediting uh, agencies will reassure you that they are member driven organizations and that if we don't like a standard, we can change it. That is a much bigger, difficult process to, to navigate and, and do than sort of saying that on a, on a piece. And so I think the more that we can participate in reviews, the more that we can participate in shaping the conversation on what counts as valuable evidence and that it is that more embedded student path, um, the ways that they actually engage meaningfully with our institutions, the, the better that relationship can be. Um, but I don't mean to be like a, like, I don't think we're ever going to get away from it until it stops being like mandated and required in particular ways where you have like very difficult to maneuver reporting parameters around. So we had some follow up questions in the chat if anybody wanted to uh, um, address those or if you feel they were addressed throughout what you were um, saying but um, Leslie chimes in and says what about institutional researchers pressing of taking off boxes rather than learning different ways of learning different goals not listed in those boxes. Um, those researchers have a tremendous influence on what we value in learning and I know Yarek and I have talked um, a lot about that any any influence. Okay. Can I oh. jump in on that point? Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. I didn't mean to, to cut you off. Oh, you didn't. You didn't. Okay. We're just fine. Um, okay. I think I wanted to, I wanted to uh, chime in with Leslie. Um, this is definitely an issue. Uh, if, if we think about instructors, uh, I guess there's three ways of thinking about this. One is that instructors now have so many different pressures, requirements, hoops to jump through, uh, and some which are quite legitimate. I mean, everything from uh, DEI to trying to quantify learning to quantifying research. I mean, depending on what institution you're in, what location you're in. Uh, so actually focusing on learning and measuring learning on your own, that's 
that can be like a minor or almost a, an afterthought at times. Uh, so we we really are often caught up in these larger bureaucratic uh, apparatuses. The second problem to think about, though, is that in the United States, the by far the largest body of instructors are part-time adjuncts, uh, which means, among other things, that they often don't have the rewards for thinking about learning. They're rewarded more for completion, more for evaluations, uh, if they're evaluated on that at all. And their pay, their compensation is so risibly poor uh, that they don't really have any incentive, much less any resources, um, because they usually don't have institutional support in order to be able to carry out, say, uh, a sustained analysis of student learning. And a third problem to think about, uh, and this circles back to the original question, you know, why is, you know, why are we having a problem with assessment? Let's think about enrollment for a second. Uh, American higher ed enrollment grew drastically until about 2012. Uh, and from 2012 through now, enrollment has dropped at least 1% every year. And in fact, every semester since. Even before COVID, we've had a decade of declining enrollment. So one reason to think about assessment is a way to better assess a student learning as a way of better supporting these students because we have fewer of them all too often. Michelle, do you wanna follow up with that? I see your hand raised. Yeah, uh, well, I wanted to speak to Leslie's question um, about institutional researchers <laughs> um, because I, having been a director of institutional research and assessment, I wanna speak on behalf of my IR colleagues. Um, you know, their primary role really is about the reporting and ticking off those boxes. Um, in terms of the role of supporting assessment now, that piece I would say is really as consultative, you know, in terms of methods in, in when you really wanna get into the learning, um, assessing student learning, working with faculty and other um, you know, uh, folks on campus who are doing that work and, and supporting in that way, but really their primary role is that, you know, pulling that institutional data, what are those outcomes, what are those retention rates, what are the DFW rates, you know, pulling off that sort of the basics that help support assessment. So I just want to sort of, you know, put that clarification out there and um, I don't think they're to blame because they're playing their role. Um, maybe in some ways they can do a, a little bit more to support assessment and I'm sure it looks differently at different, you know, different campuses and different systems. I've also done assessment and IR in the privates at USC, University of Southern California, and also Whittier College. So I have that, and then the CSU as my experience. I have not worked at the CCs, so um, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I may look a little different there, but I just wanted to sort of throw that out there um, to speak to that point. And Natasha, if, if, if I could chime oh, in, I'm, I'm going to defend our IR folks with you, Michelle, because I don't think it's often their choice to collect only that data in those ways and check the boxes. Uh, the pressures are on them, and it, it's often just a um, a product of the systems within which we work, as well as the, the, the fact that as we're being driven to do more data-driven decision-making, uh, that we aren't growing, there aren't the resources there to grow our IR staff. So you're talking most often about shorthanded departments with a load of work to do. And as faculty, we understand this in our own context, right? But, you know, so, so it's often just uh, survival, get those pieces checked off that they can and, and, you know, at least I know some IR folks who would love to engage in these conversations more regularly with us, um, but their time and their load doesn't allow it. And so, you know, maybe that's a deeper question we have here, too, is, you know, over time, how can we engage our IR folks into more meaningful conversations about assessment in ways where they can bring in their assessment expertise and evaluation expertise, and we can bring in that teaching and learning expertise. Agreed. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, that, and that's why I'm in assessment, because that's really my passion. <laughs> and I wanted to do more of that. So you're so right. And the resource question is big. Yeah, Natasha, I'm sorry. No, you're great. I love all of this. And I just want to sort of build off of it and talk about so when you think about the historical arc of assessment conversations, a lot of it was very heavy by measurement people, not learning folks per se. So you have a ton of that that's happening. And when you look at two, like, where did assessment positions start popping up? It was in IR units. And so it was like IR and assessment or institutional effectiveness and assessment. You then also see this assessment and accreditation positions that happen. So then you're like, well, shoot, it's in my title. <laughs> you have to go around and do this stuff. What I am really excited about is sort of a shift that we're starting to see in terms of the position descriptions and where assessment positions are housed within institutions to be more closely connected with centers for teaching and learning which sends different signals in that regard and the conversations that you can have. Um, having a liaison relationship with an institutional effectiveness or IR so you can get a better big picture data in that space or bring in the decision making as possible. But being at the table much sooner uh, on the conversations around what kind of data should we collect. So as we think about like, well, let's do data driven decision making, that's fantastic. 
often we do it with the data we have. And so we have a lot of grades, we have retention, you know, we have the things that we consistently collect. And we don't really have a good history of knowing how to collect learning data well across an institution. And so it often gets kind of left to the side. <laughs> so we're like, well, we'll figure that out later. Or like we have some and we'll talk about it at a smaller program meeting or between faculty and in, in a in a hallway or, or Zoom. And being at the table sooner to talk about how can we collect what types of data in ways that are meaningful and then feed that as well into students and get student voice more involved and think differently about learning data that we can collect i think is something that's really positive to see coming out um, from conversations and thinking too differently about that what that means on how you spend your time as an assessment person and and who you're partnering with within the institution and so i just wanted to share that it's not all i are again on that point but i do like the ways that i'm seeing different partnership spaces start to play out in sort of titles organizational structure and job descriptions for folks thank you natasha for those comments this is uh, you know I'm, I'm i'm kind of like scanning the chat here and and the question one of the questions was you know what it is that's working well because again was uh, echoing brian's comments it's it's true. We are adjuncts are blindsided by by the demands of the system. Now apparently the researchers are too. I just wonder, you know, where is the role of administrators and full time faculty? I mean, it looks like you know every every turn we take, there is there's trouble there. So what is it that's 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 working uh, in 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 our system? What can we if 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 you were again collectively give us a, a this this. Uh, the piece of advice or, 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 you know, hey, move it in this direction, you'll be okay. I'll start, I'll kick it off. <laughs> Some ideas by time for others to think. But um, I, I think the closer that you can get this to where faculty live, the better. So the more that you can talk about assignments, as ways that you're assessing student learning and how are you setting up your assignment conversation and the in the general of this is your basic pedagogy you're doing pedagogical things that are like how are you being transparent how are you setting students up how are you thinking about it and that assessment is part of that teaching and learning process that's a huge win um, there's a long history our faculty remember they have been through different iterations of this <laughs> throughout the times especially those that have, have lasted around they remember when this was mandated by states in the 80s and so to you have to do some of that how is this different from that that this isn't sort of an administrative fad but this is about good practice for the things that we're doing in our it's not an add-on but this is part of just good pedagogy and good teaching and setting it up that way. And then how are you pulling things from that? I think it's definitely a space um, of working. And that's where partnerships with Center for Teaching and Learning, thinking about instructional design, all of these become um, re really beneficial. The second one that I'll, I'll just throw out is the more that you can involve students, the better this all seems to go. And so we do have a long history in assessment of doing assessment to our students. They are the object of our assessment. Sometimes they did not even know that that's what's going on with them. And we have a lot of learning outcomes that we wrote for ourselves that our students look at and are like, I don't know what you're even telling me or what this means or how this adds value. And so the more that we can think about and involve students in our process as our as the ones that are doing this learning and needing to understand their own learning um, to be much more active and engaged in that process and also better in their transference of knowledge and, and to just even talk about what they know and can do from a, a learning experience that the better we are all in that situation and then using those students as allies in partnership with others to talk to administration about the importance of this work uh, cannot be understated I think a lot of times faculty get a bad rap within their institutions it's like oh you know, Cheryl, I'm just going to use you just because, but like Cheryl's always going to bring that up because Cheryl, that's what Cheryl talks about. And so we're not going to listen to Cheryl when she raises these really great, important points. And so having someone else <laughs> say these things, especially students talking about like, this is my experience. This is what I need. Um, back to Brian's point at a time when like, we need to hear and listen and keep every student that we have. Um, that can be incredibly powerful to persuade and, and engage in dialogue with our administration. But so students, and keeping it close to home for faculty. Absolutely fantastic, and 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 I tell you, you've touched on so many points that we are we are about to explore in in, in a bit greater depth. So so thank you very much for the for the insights, uh, Brian. If I could perhaps uh, uh, ask you for for uh, final thoughts on this, what would be the direction to take for faculty? As my, as uh, Natasha just 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 outlined. Faculty and student engagement is is just absolutely paramount in this discussion. The question is how how do you make how do you think we can make it happen? Because we haven't been obviously doing it, right? 
Well, there's two ways we can do this, and both have issues. Um, the way that we've often been doing it is bottom up, where you have a faculty member, you have some staff, maybe you have a center or a, you know, an administrator who is able to push this a bit. Um, and then they just try and expand their interest. Uh, so you're hosting conversations, spreading professional development, growing uh, people's ability to think about student learning, changing their assessments, changing their grading and all that. Um, the other way is from, from the top down is when the, uh, the board or the state uh, mandates this or supports it, uh, the president encourages this and it comes from the head of academia, if it's a, you know, if it's a provost or a VP for academics and then put drives this down through departments, uh, divisions in some places, then down to departments. Um, the former has the advantage of being more democratic and more based on interest and, and participation. It has the downside of taking a lot of time to grow and also running into all kinds of obstacles, including faculty status. Uh, the second one has the uh, advantage of being centralized and has the potential of actually having money attached to it, which is great. Uh, it has the downside of running into one size fits all problems and also being seen not unrightly as an imposition uh, by faculty. Uh, I, I think in many ways it's going to depend on the culture of institution, its size, its character, its shape of faculty governance, how it treats um, paracurricular centers like assessment centers. Um, but I think one or the other uh, is going to have to be involved and in either way, it's gonna require a lot of resources. It's gonna require money in order to pay for people's time as well as for new hires. And it's gonna require just a lot of time to do this. And right now we don't have a lot of either money or time. Uh, so it's gonna take some serious political negotiation in order to ring free the capital to do this. Wow, it, Brian, it, it, it resembles, uh, it reminds me of our, uh, uh, climate crisis discussion, right? We have to do something about it immediately. And look I where think, we are, right? Nothing is uh, happening anywhere. So that's that's yeah. just fantastic that you put it in that perspective. It's 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 true. It's 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 been a, a, a contention for so many years, time and money, and really uh, focus on 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 learning, engagement of faculty and students. What Natasha was just referring to. So this is just mm -hmm. fantastic discussion. Thank you very much for the for for, for your insights. Uh, we we should move on to slide number two because again, many of those issues are going to come back. Amanda, if you could please, yeah, there is there is the guided pathways, and I'll let Enrique explain the concept. Oh, the concept. Uh... Uh, Jerry asked me to be the bad guy. So I want to be the bad guy here. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, so when this, uh, I don't know if this is, when we, when we saw this kind of pathways, I don't know if it was a mandate or it was a more of a, there you go, go ahead and do it. Uh, as, a, as an SLO coordinator, I asked myself, you know, we have pillar number one, two, three, and four, right? And the first thing I asked, well, wow, pillar number four, you know, ensure that learning is happening with intentional outcomes. Uh, and so, okay, how are we gonna do that? Pillar number one, two, and three. And so the first thing I did, I called Jerry. Jerry, what is your college doing about this? And the response I got from Jerry was, well, pillar number one is taken care of, pillar number two is taken care of, Pillar number three is taken care of. And I thought to myself, well, we're doing the same thing. But what about pillar number four? Who is responsible to do pillar number four? And how do we, how do we know that uh, ensuring is happening? Uh, to me, pillar number one, this is my personal opinion, pillar number one, two, and three are student uh, data driven. It focuses more of uh, the vision for success. And for me, pillar number four, it's uh, student achievement data and equity does not equate that student learning took place. So please, I'd like to hear your point of view. I'll actually jump in since you mentioned the vision for success and I was just gonna type something into the chat. Um, 
you know, rem remembering that we have an audience that's international here. And so not everybody necessarily knows the, the vision for success is, is our uh, plan. I think we're going to assume from the chancellor's office. So it, it's within the California community colleges, although we know guided pathways is more universal than that. But, um, you know, the community colleges brought guided pathways to us as a way in, in you know, central leadership's mind of um, accomplishing the, the students uh, or the vision for success and all the objectives set within it. Um, but I think what you mentioned is, you know, that again, those first three pillars, and, and I would often say, and again, within the California Community College specifically, we pushed really hard to get, to get colleges to have faculty leadership uh, in their guided pathways efforts. That was a challenge and, and still continues to be a challenge on many campuses. Uh, but those first three pillars in particular are further outside the classroom than the rest. And so when we talk about four, now we're going back to those faculty mm -hmm. conversations. And, you know, how do we, and, and um, I think it was Eugene made a comment earlier about that, that currency, grades are the currency of education. I'd take credit hours or another currency of education. You know, how do we take those conversations from beyond faculty to institutional conversations? The rest are more structural. You know, hey, what do our degree paths look like? You know, everybody can have weigh in on that. Uh, you know, what, what support services do we have for students? But when it's really talking about um, what are, what do we need students to learn? How are we assessing it? And then how are we, you know, then engaging in more conversation about that? Uh, I think all of our colleges are hung up on that. Sure, and you mentioned that, you know, in pillar number one and two and three, it seems more like they're in the student services side. Uh, but then again, who's responsible for pillar number four? Is it the ESL coordinator? Is it the faculty? You know, is it the college? Who? And then how do we start assessing pillar number four? So I think Michelle can add something to it because again, it refers to the whole structure of our system in community colleges. And as Cheryl's mentioned, this is, uh, the, the concept is well known in, in uh, four year universities as well. The idea is that students are being onboarded by a certain group of people, there is admissions and records, there is outreach, there is all kinds of people working on this, right? Making sure that students stay on the path is something that, that again, our counselors are working very hard at. And, and uh, there is, again, uh, divisions perhaps of people who are, who are busy making sure that that happens. When it comes to uh, graduating and making sure that students uh, transfer, well, as you know, we have mechanisms for that as well. And then the question is, what do we do about student learning? And I think that's that's the part that's just not not uh, uh, done well. And uh, uh, again, even even people who have uh, introduced the guided pathways concept uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, they they did a follow up study, I believe, about a year ago, that that really asked where did the money go to uh, to um, support guided pathways. And I believe one of the colleges in California participated in the in the study. And it looks like there really isn't an, an, an institution that has figured out how to address pillar number four, which is ensuring learning. And, and that's, that's, again, uh, one of those rocks that we try to turn over and see what's, what's going on there. And the picture is just not what we would like to see. So the question that, that, that I think um, uh, emerges from, from, from this experience is why, why do we keep failing? Why is it that we have three quarters or 90% of the college working for the first three pillars and then everything else is, is unaccounted for, for lack of a better expression? Why, why is there such, such, such gap? What's causing it? You want me to <laughs> maybe say so? What I think, uh, and again, I, it's a very macro answer, I'm sorry, <laughs> which the macro ones are the ones hard, that are hard to solve, right, I guess. But what I'm thinking of, and I think especially what you're saying about the pillars is that it goes back to that siloing, you know, especially faculty versus staff or, you know, all the folks. So all the folks working on the first three pillars um, and, and it goes back to resources on across all the board, all the faculty and all the staff to, really everybody is working to capacity over, you know, really working hard. 
But I think it's important that faculty are involved in those discussions. Like everybody is involved in student success and retention. And a lot of times that like support services, let's say tutoring and supplemental instruction and things like that are happening over here. And the folks who are delivering that, sometimes there's not even that communication with the faculty in the classroom. Now that gets right at learning and supporting the learning. So that connection is important. Sometimes it happens well, hopefully, especially with the supplemental instruction because of that model, but sometimes not. And, and, and faculty, um, they're the ones who can see the early signs of difficulty for a student in the classroom struggling. And hopefully they're making that referral to some of the support, the student services and student, uh, student affairs support that's available, but sometimes not. But I do feel like um, a lot of it is the silos. And then same thing with the learning and uh, learning assessment and faculty feeling overtaxed and it not being, um, always the, you know, the top priority and the fact that there's that sort of sense of, okay, this is my autonomy. This is my course. I'm responsible. You know, I get to do this and no one can tell, you know, there's that sort of resistance to the efforts, whether it's administration or a coordinator, an SLO coordinator who should be empowered by the administration to be able to, you know, to work with the faculty and request these things. But in the end, it's still sort of like the fact, I feel like there's that, well, this is me and my course, and this is what I'm responsible for. And this is what I get paid for. And here's my contract. And you guys do that. And that's a lot of the challenge, I think, uh, that why it's hard to be successful in this. I don't know. Michelle, do you think that there's an effort of um, nine institution research office, but got some colleges focusing on, on student achievement to measure pillar number four, which to, measure. to me, to measure student achievement. I mean, student achievement, you know, student success, transfer rate, and they're using those measurements. For, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's efforts. Yeah, there are. But I mean, I just in terms of that question of like, what's some of the barriers to the success and to getting I, I feel like a lot of it is sort of the structural pieces and roles and, uh, and, and, and resources, I guess, because I think a lot of faculty want to be able to do that stuff too, but but to really deliver their course as well to, to those who are super engaged in making sure learning is happening and assessing and adjusting you know, right there within the doing formative assessment and maybe changing some of their assignments. You know, that takes a lot of work. I've taught, I know what I know what that's involved. Like that's a lot. So yeah, there's definitely efforts. I don't want to sound totally pessimistic. <laughs> Natasha. Oh, Grace, did you, I thought you raised your hand. Did you want to say something? And then I'm happy to jump in after. Oh yeah, no, I just wanted to say in terms of, um, we talked about what's working well. Um, it's just starting in, in my uh, campus, but we have a tri-chair model in Guided Pathways. So we have classified professional faculty and administrative um, input and all the deans are in it. And I do feel like as SLO coordinator, I have a seat at the table. And so I am making sure that ensure learning is happening is coming from the coordinate, you know, SLO coordinator part with faculty input. So I do feel like that helps. And you're right, Michelle, that's what I heard before I came in that it was all about silos. Well, now I meet regularly with you know, IEC and curriculum. I'm part of the curriculum committee now. And so breaking down those barriers, I think you're right, is, is absolutely key to making this, this work. That's why I just wanted to share that part. Thanks. Thank you, Grace. Natasha? Thank you, Grace. So I want to pick up on a Leslie Smith added a great point in here that, that I'm going to also pick up on in this. So I want to come at this from three different angles. One is when you think about implementing an initiative at a community college. When you've seen one community college, you've seen one community college. They are so different. The context is different. The local place-based nature of the institution is different. The students that they serve is different. And while pillars are a helpful way to structure, um, trying to say, like, let's implement something across in way uh, with a set of rigidity that doesn't account for that individual place can lead to a lot of implementation trouble. So part of this is thinking about the ways that we can implement um, I don't know, things that work, these quotes around that. And in other parts of higher ed, we have a much harder time in community colleges because of how they were intentionally designed to be responsive and serve local needs and, and, and engage in that way. So I think that's sort of one piece to think about. The second is that there are um, huge equity implications that goes in to things like guided pathways to Leslie's point on we didn't ask the students in, in a lot of ways what happens in um, implementation of efforts like this is we try to ask students to be students they are not. We try to say take X amount of courses in this sequence at this time and that's just not how our students engage with our institutions it's not how they have the time to participate in education. Um, and we're you, know, you try to force a student to become a way <laughs> that they are in terms of how we 
engage in that, you have a lot of trouble getting to ensuring learning is happening. If I create one, that clear pathway, but a student moves through it in a totally different manner, how can I talk at the end that learning happened in that pathway? I'm now sort of stuck. And that's not how we assess. That doesn't make sense because we can't really think about pathway movement in that same way for our students. We have to think differently about how they're learning. And a lot of community college assessment has historically been course-based. And thinking about how to move that to a program, it's really tricky. And so to then think like, how do you do that as a pathway? If our students aren't moving through, I don't want to tell you about that data. <laughs> like, I don't know where they took it out of sequence. And if I designed it to be a sequence situation, like, oh, what do you do there? If you came in with credit for somewhere else, you came with a certification, like, you know, how, how does this sort of fit together in those different places I think it. So one is how we think about assessing a pathway might not actually be an applicable way to think about assessment within a community college and how we think about what those pathways are might not be ways that work for our students um, and how they, they move through and engage. So I think course taking patterns, it gets really, it's an interesting sort of flex to try to work on. But I do think, I'm mean, going to get to your question, one and four are totally connected. When our faculty try to talk about what you're doing in this course and what you get from this and where you can apply this elsewhere, they're being really clear about the pathway of learning you can take from what we're talking about. And so if we think about what you're learning in a course and what we're, we're equipping you with in this one experience, let's say, what that enables you to do elsewhere or what pathways that opens up for you, that's a way that we can talk about it. I think that makes much more sense to our faculty um, about I'm enabling learning that creates opportunities to move elsewhere. And then I can ensure that's learning happening in a very different way that keeps it sort of close to home. Um, so that's a sort of different winded way to talk about the difficulty of implementation efforts of, of national projects like this in a community college setting um, and the, the tension that that plays between how our students actually move through an experience and how we want them to for institutions. So there's that student value, institution value that, that plays out very differently. And when we're meeting so many student needs and goals, um, pathways uh, real life, Mr. Papa, you know? become everywhere. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Natasha. That's that's exactly right. I think again, this is this this recurring theme of paying attention to what it is that we should be doing to begin with addressing the needs, educational needs of mm -hmm. our students, right? So so absolutely. With that, I, I would like to move on to the next uh, uh, slide and, and Grace will, will introduce uh, the topic of equity, please. Hey, actually, I think, Natasha, your response is a perfect segue into this slide of equity, right? So we have three quotes here, um, Cesar Chavez, James Baldwin, and, and John Dewey. Uh, you can read the, the quotes, but I think what we wanted to point out was that we talk about the value of education, which is what we want for our students. And in all three quotes, not one of these talks about assessment, right? It's talking about education and learning, and I think that's what, as you mentioned, that's what we really want. Now, so when it comes to equity, for example, um, you know, we want it authentic assessments, right? We, we go back to that and why are our students not all achieving the learning that we want and everything. So we'd be curious in terms of, uh, as the panel, how do you see equity, you know, playing out in student learning outcomes, ensuring that learning that we're talking about in guided pathways too? Yeah, we could start with Brian. We didn't hear from him last time. <laughs> well, I'm I'm not sure what I can add here. I I'd really like to keep learning from other speakers. I guess the one thing I, I want to add, if I could, really quickly to this point, is that uh, there's a there's a strong impetus behind improving these pathways. Uh, I mean, there's the desire to graduate students more frequently, uh, more frequently on time. Um, and also that sense of, you know, rising anxiety about the number of students who exit higher education with student debt, but without any diploma. And we really, really want to prevent that from happening. And in the community college world, of course, there's the, you know, the two-faced you know, problem that's been going on for more than a generation of, you know, you want to have students who graduate with a associate's degree, and also you want them to, um, move on, transfer to a four-year uh, for a, a BA or a BS. Um, I, I think there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of pressure for this. It's also 
I think partly reflecting that we have expanded our curriculum really intensely uh, for the past, well, 50 years, really. Um, just the sheer amount of courses that we can offer is just vast. And it's just increasingly difficult to wend your way through them. And I think mean, we all know that first generation students are increasing in numbers. And for them to you know, reach a complex uh, course catalog without a pathway through can be uh, a real bear. So I just want to put in those strategic aspects first, and then I, I want to fall silent and hear from the rest of you. I can jump in a little. <clears throat> so my, um, so where I go first is say, okay, and this is often the starting point. Where, what is our IR data telling us, our institutional data? We can look at, you know, equity gaps. That's like the starting point. And that we, you know, going really to, to stay focused on student learning outcomes, looking at course, you know, performance, basically an equity gaps and performance is important. And that often reveals, uh, you know, and whether that's, you know, well, the easiest way to do that is obviously like DFW rates, you know, and then disaggregating that by our demographics. And we often see those equities. So really to focus in on that course level and student learning outcomes, which I, yeah, I'm considering like really the smallest piece of the part where the intervention happens. I mean, that's about pedagogy. And that goes back to, you know, in the classroom, assuring learning, faculty training, the centers for teaching and learning, supporting all of that in different ways of, um, you know, faculty delivering the content and approaching pedagogy, uh, recognizing different ways of knowing that our students bring in with them, um, approaching thing, learning and teaching in a strengths-based way. Um, there's the work by Muses about culturally engaging campus environments and how it's important, especially um, as Brian just mentioned, the you know increasing numbers of first generation college students and the diversity of our, our students now across the entire nation. We really have to uh, meeting students where they're at. That's what's important on both the, especially right there in the classroom. That's so important because we know that's really where the rubber hits the road. It's about you know, the courses they're taking, the learning they're getting and, and progressing through to whatever the achievement is, whether it's a certificate transfer to a four year um, and so forth, or, or whether it's just, yeah, I mean, it may even just be taking a couple courses that help support, you know, uh, some career development that somebody's doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that's just the, and then of course we can look at equity gaps in terms of persistence and retention and graduation and transfer rates. And that, that gets to more of that holistic, not just in the classroom and the student learning assessment, but the assessment of other, the other support services um, and, and how they're all working together. So that goes back to that sort of integrated piece that I'm working on with the um, cross-divisional and so forth. But I think to focus in, uh, you know, I wanted to really stay with that student learning outcomes. It really is about that coursework, the faculty, the pedagogy and, and how we can, um, work toward equity and, and it really uh, that faculty training piece is really or professional development is really a challenge and one of the things earlier I was going to mention and this is this could be a way bigger conversation but I've been curious and wondering it's been 20 years since I did my doctoral program so I don't know but I don't think you know faculty when they're getting trained <laughs> as graduate students in any field you know maybe STEM does it a little bit more but certainly generally none of us were taught to be teachers we were I mean generally speaking you know maybe at the, even at the master's level I don't think I'm, I don't know it's really about being a researcher right and then you work within you work with a faculty maybe you're a teaching assistant you learn it at, you learn it from what you were how you were taught and or how you saw it being done and learning outcomes were never part of it like the folks who are educators you know who have degrees in education know this stuff but the rest of us don't sociologists don't know this psychologists maybe a little more because that's that dovetails with education learning motivation but you know the political scientists the <laughs> the historians like that's not what we're trained to do so has that changed in doctoral programs i don't think so but does anyone know because i don't and i've been wondering because that's where it also needs to happen if we're going to change it overall in the system of higher ed Right, F fantastic comments. Really, really appreciate this, Michelle. That's 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 exactly right. I think, uh, again, uh, we are focused on uh, we the the data that moves our discuss the equity discussions uh, very often has to do with variables that exist outside of even students knowing that they do, in a sense that we count how many students enroll. Sure, students know that they enrolled. It's just that we count it. And if there is a bump in enrollment from semester to semester, we call it a success. We never ask students how they feel about it, whether that matters to them, right? So the, the, the same thing is with, 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 with learning, or, or I, I believe that that would be exactly my point. 
that as, as Natasha mentioned, and, and she mentioned that in, in, in her book a few years back, the degrees that matter, right? That SLLs were never written for students. Again, it's a measure of accountability. It really has nothing to do with the human beings that we have, whose, whose needs we are going to address. And that's why, again, going back to Grace's introduction of the topic of equity, look at what it is that the thinkers, the theorists tell us we should be doing. And we seem to be driven by other measures of accountability, other measures of, of uh, keeping ourselves in check, for lack of a better expression, right? And, and when it comes to empowerment and making sure that students actually make a difference in their communities, for example, or even I believe it was actually Brian's, one of the Brian's guests recently who said, you know, what just just imagine the discussion around uh, equity lines, uh, who are the students who are creative thinkers or problem solvers or leaders? Who are the ones who are gaining those skills to excel from within their own realities? And I think that's that's the part that we are really not addressing in, in, in our equity discussions at all. We, we normally are, 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 are focused on, again, course completion, you know, hey, you, you, you seem to be struggling with homework, then I'll give you a pass or, or you know, don't, don't worry about that midterm. But it's still the system of accountability, as Michelle described, that's not really invented by faculty, but rather ingrained over the years that we go, you know, through educational system and we are really Re, re, reassuring or confirming the system that we've that 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 made us successful, right? So there isn't really that much of a of a window for creativity here. If it worked for us as faculty, look where we are now. Then it must be working for our students. And there is just some of those students who are just not going to make it. So that I think is the is 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 the bigger uh, bigger picture here when it comes to equity. And I know that I, I think Natasha, if you could please. Um, um, I, I, I see. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to respond to this. I'm trying to like keep myself back. So we have a book that comes out this month on like equity and assessments. So I was like, I have so many words. But Michelle, I want to I want to start with um, and I will try to keep myself brief. So we'll see how well this works. But um, excellent point raised about the the training and, and the faculty piece is part of this um, and, and Yarek as well. But if you think about it, it's really fascinating because it's an industry where we produce as institutions of education what we hire and we don't change our talent pipeline to account for the things that we need <laughs> in our structures like what that's madness and no other system would you have that happen um, and so that's just this really fascinating like I don't know how we change our hiring process or what we look for who needs to start like pushing it, but I can say it, it is not picked up speed. The Teagle Foundation did a, a report with um, deans for the Council of Graduate Schools on if they saw faculty preparation in teaching and learning as a part of graduate education, and it was a resounding no. And so that's that's its own thing that we can tackle at a different time. So I, I wanted to close the loop <laughs> for you on that one, and I, I don't have good news other than I think we got to work on some hiring intake <laughs> processes, maybe to to change the the need of, of what we have in this space. But but to think about sort of the equity and, and assessment piece of it, we have we well, let's just all agree for a second that education as a system and an enterprise is a history of inequality. <laughs> like that was a huge part of what I was doing. So to try to think about how do we embed this in our learning and our assessment has been quite a, especially when you also have a lot of measurement pieces happening in on that. But we oftentimes equate system success with student success right. in these conversations. And I don't think that's a, we need to break that equation to get into some of these conversations. And so system success could be, we're getting things through, we're looking at these numbers, da, 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 da. and that's for the system and the way that the system is designed values and inherently value laden and, and all of those pieces. But students and the success that they have has not been accounted for in any of that space. And so if you think about in our learning and our assessment processes, we, we signal what we value and what we have said counts as knowledge or evidence of learning. No one else gets to be a part of that conversation oftentimes like we made that decision and then students are held up to it to say, where do you fall out. 
And in research on students and sort of validating learning, or do they see themselves as learning? Assessment has been the number one space where students say, I am not a learner. It has told me that I can't learn because the way that I know I know something doesn't have currency here and we lose them. So when we think about back to the pathways conversation, we could put as many supports and student affairs and others around them as they want. But if every time they come into a learning experience, they are getting hit with the way that they know something has no value. It doesn't have a space in here and they have to learn some other way. We're going to lose them regardless of the wraparound supports. And so for me, when we think about the quotes that are here and what is our purpose of education, first and foremost, part of our purpose of assessment should not be to take away the joy of learning from a person and participating and involved, but that it should be to lift up and elevate the way that they think about and speak about and talk about how they know what they know and can do and how they're able to, to put that together in a way to make the case to other audiences and engage and that that has value and a space in it. And I think that of going education is life itself in that space is that the way that you live and the way that you move through and make decisions really brings that to bear. But in our systems of assessment, we have this very measurement history driven, we have this very process oriented piece that doesn't really have um, space for that. And I think we also see that play out, last thing I'll say, is an assumptions that happen around what we need to change if we see students not learning. And a lot of the times the choices that we make on what we think students need or what we want to change for our students don't live up to um, the, our, our Cesar Chavez quote here in, in the ways that we support our students and, and engage in that learning and, and sort of make choices for them, um, where they become then, well, I'm not afraid of this system anymore <laughs> because I've already gone through all of these things and, and persisted and we should not have students that leave whatever their time with us is feeling that they they um, persisted, not that they achieved. And um, and I think that that distinction a lot of times get lost in our system to students. So I will stop there. I apologize for my wide range rant, but um, thank you so much for this conversation and Michelle for bringing up the importance of faculty. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yes, Natasha, thank you so much. So before I even, um, Gosh, you, you're right. I mean, you you've touched on some so many so many different aspects of it. I, I don't even know where, where where to start. But I first of all, I do like the um, system success and uh, versus uh, equating with 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 student success. And and maybe Cheryl would be the best person to 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 ask to address it. If you could, Cheryl, obviously, I don't mean to be putting you on the spot. Uh, but the 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 bottom line is that see, as Brian mentioned, we need time and money. And that's a huge, huge picture. That's just, just, just this, this, you know, sky is the limit effort practically, right? And now I'm seeing here in the in the chat room, Jim is asking, what part of learning, how to teach, is beneficial? What do we need to know? Again, I see nothing but a gap: institution and the student, time and money, and teaching and learning those things somehow are just not jiving in higher ed. And again, uh, I, 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 I do, well, I mean, I, I just need to bring up Brian's videos, you know, Brian's uh, conversations that he has. That's, that seems to be confirmed by many people who speak about what's going on in higher education these days. So, so again, uh, Cheryl, if you don't mind, would you please uh, bring down the, the, or break down this, 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 issue of uh, student success versus system success? Because again, it seems like that's what we are after. What, what is your take on it? If we just talk student success and system success, I mean, to me, it's driven by funding. And so the conversation is always about system success because in order for the system to continue to fund itself, it, it must prove that it's successful. And it often then establishes its own measures of what success means. Some certainly are imposed, but again, it, it's a completely different conversation than what is student success. And I think I, I'm recalling, I'm, I'm thinking back to, I think it was last spring, Natasha, when you did the series on democracy and assessment and, you know, thinking about how hard it is to measure what it means, what all the elements are and what it means to be democratic and, and to work and, and live and learn in this democratic society. And I, again, I, I think it's just that difficulty versus saying we're churning out so many students in X amount of time and, and you know those easy metrics versus saying, what does it mean to be an engaged uh, member of our society? What does it mean to be the benefit of social justice um, and social change? And what does it mean? How does your family look different now than it did when you started your education? Um, I, to me, they're completely different conversations. And 
you know, going back even to the, the guided pathways conversation, one of my frustrations all along, like it, it's good intent to think that we, we've done, we have such a, 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 a shoots, a smattering of options for students and perhaps too many, well, you know, we've taken it too far, but uh, to say that every student needs to follow the same pathway in, in the same manner, and I think Natasha, you referred to this, isn't going to work. I mean, you said that we have, if you look at one community college, you have looked at one community college, not more than that. And I really think that unless you're, if you're only looking at one student or one cluster of students, you're not looking far enough. I mean, in my experience, students don't learn the same. They don't have the same pressures on the outside of the class. All those pieces that influence during learning that are out of my control uh, as a classroom teacher uh, are, are gonna be different leverages and different degrees for each one of those students. And so just the nuance, the difficulty in, in diving into that, I think we continue to revert to system success. Let's stay funded versus going further into what our students need. So that's that's it, Cheryl. You you said it. it the matter is that the, the what makes the difference is funding. That's just that. We haven't had a we we don't have a system. We haven't figured out how to reimburse colleges for learning. That's just that. And again, some someone sent me a message here. What if the whole guided pathway system was turned upside down? If we started with student learning and then built a system around it? Hello? Just imagine that, what, what, what would happen? But again, the bottom line is that the reason we have those three pillars, as Enrique was saying earlier, so well articulated, is because there is money behind it. And then with, when it comes to assessment of student learning, well, it's a faculty purview, let them deal with it. There is their coordinator. Go ahead, have your discussions. Um, as, as Brian said, time and money is in short supply. This is just, 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 just a lost cause, it seems, without money. Uh, Brian, if you were to um, add to this discussion of system success versus student success, since this is probably the, the best I can do at this point, considering that, you know, I see a myriad of issues here coming up in the chat. Would you please summarize the discussion for us, please? Well, if I want to summarize it, I would say that we're dealing with a very, very complex ecosystem uh, with many, many moving parts, most of which are not thinking about assessment of student learning, and most of which are tasked and incentivized to respond to many, many other rewards and incentives. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to alter the behavior of this complex organism, and you're trying to get it to actually take the assessment of student learning seriously. And I think it's going to take some complex systems theory, perhaps the work of folks like uh, uh, Donna Meadows, to try to really apply levers to the right positions in this complex system. And by system, I mean the overall system of post-secondary education. It varies between countries, of course, and it can vary within countries uh, quite extensively. I think we're, if so if we can dive into a couple of those pieces, well, one of them is faculty. We have the fact that faculty are usually not trained in teaching at all. And most of their incentives, depending on where they work, don't have anything to do with teaching or at least with, with learning and measured student results. Um, that's one major issue. And we already talked about the labor issues before. We can think as well about the um, problems of limited funding and limited attention. But then also we have the huge issue of equity and trying to get institutions to pay attention to equity is so far proven to be very, very challenging. Uh, symbolic changes uh, are often costly, such as renaming a building, costly in terms of politics, and then changing promotion, tenure, hiring, and review processes are really, really difficult to do uh, in terms of micropolitics of individual departments. So I, I think to, to sum up, we're looking at, you know, Archimedes trying to move the world here. And I think in order to do so, we're gonna really have to develop some kind of comprehensive strategy. Thank you as always, Brian, for bringing this big, big picture uh, in, in, into the conversation. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. We just, we just can't, can't move away from this. We do need to uh, stay focused. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the insightful summary. Uh, Amanda, could we move to the next slide, please? And this is, this is going back to the data. And, and I tell you, this is an attempt to address, again, this, this gap that I, that I mentioned earlier. We do have 
data on one side of the spectrum. Michelle already spoke about this. And on the other side of the, of the spectrum, we have data that really does not address the question of student learning. We just, we just don't have institutions and uh, programs that would do it well. Uh, it's, they, they, they are there. It, we certainly have in the system capacity to build it up. The question is, if you were to envision what type of story could assessment of student learning tell us? What would data focused on assessment of student learning, competency, skill attainment? What do you think we could, we could learn from this? Why, and, and perhaps, you know, again, addressing Brian's bigger picture, why aren't we talking about it? Why don't we feel compelled to ask questions about data that really is focused, reflective of what it is that students learn rather than what, what they achieve? I think number one, it might be because it's so qualitatively rich. That's not to say that there isn't some quantitative data, but I think SLO assessment really is so much more of a qualitative endeavor, supplemented, I would say, by or complemented by quantitative. And I'm a mixed methodologist too, so maybe that's just my frame of reference, but and it's 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 harder to uh summarize and to you know and then also if in this i i want i wondered yark in this this question the quote here um to improve student outcomes here do we mean student outcomes meaning like transfer rate or graduation rate or completion rate is that what they is that what's presumed in the student outcomes so michelle just, just so that you know that's that's one of the slides that we will probably not have time to to tackle today but uh, let me just say that uh, there is the, the confusion about those designations has always been there ever pretty much day one when I started yeah. reading Natasha's papers, to be honest. <laughs> there is student learning outcomes and learning outcomes and student outcomes right. and achievement and objectives and yeah. in any, any configuration. And it's gotten to the point where we have our, you know, if, uh, institutional effectiveness meetings and we just call student outcomes. And obviously everyone in the room knows what we mean by this. Yeah. And the discussion moves on. Uh, nobody's asking what you just did. That again, that's that's probably one of the uh, pitfalls and, and and really tragedies of the whole discussion about assessment of student learning. That those terms have never been defined to the point that will make a difference or or or, or um, reaffirm that when we use those terms, we know what we are talking about. Yeah. And, and, and that's just that. So this is um, this definitely refers to, you know, the conversation is about the assessment of student learning. So let's just yeah. let's just leave it well, at that. Right. Well, the reason I say it, though, too, is because I think intuitively or the way it has been in this is part of the context of what we've been talking about is that general student outcomes does mean something that's valued by the powers that be with the funders or the different stakeholders and so forth. So that's why, you know, and that tends to be some sort of rates. It does tend to be quantitative, something that we can, you know, rank against others and so forth. But then the, the student learning assessment, I'll still stand by what I said before, is more qualitatively rich and harder to, to summarize. And then and even and then to connect it to, to these sorts of quantitative measures, the traditional measures we have, whether it's transfer rate or completion or whatever, time to completion. Um, it's not a direct connection either. It kind of, again, it goes through, the learning is happening in the course, keeping it to courses. I, there is learning outside the classroom. I'm gonna keep it for the sake of this at the course level. And then you have to kind of like, okay, what's happening at this course? And then that goes to DFW rates. And we know the whole grading is a whole nother piece of the conversation and whether that, you know, we know that that's ripe with problems in terms of what it's measuring with learning. But even that right there is kind of illustrating what I'm saying, sort of jumping from the qualitative to really students demonstrating via, let's say, a portfolio, for example, or other demonstrated ways that they can show what they've learned. That's very qualitatively really rich. And yes, we can do rubrics and we can quantify them. I mean, that's been sort of the piece we've built to sort of make that bridge, but it still kind of comes to this sort of, to summarize the course, well, then you can say, okay, yes, uh, rates on the rubric. I mean, that gets a little bit better at it. Um, anyways, I do feel like there's something about it. We're trying to translate those things to, to connect sort of the qualitative and the quantitative. Um, and, the, and that's labor, labor rich, labor intensive too, even using rubric and scoring products, uh, papers or portfolios and so forth. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop.
Right on, right on. Yes, and I and I would like to latch on to what, what Leslie is just putting in the in the in the chat room. Um, yes, if we could just empower students to solve problems, right? And 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 in the process of them solving problems, we can um, attest to the fact that they demonstrate certain skills and competencies to solve these problems. And that would probably be it. And again, not that I have all the answers all of a sudden, but I think that's where the discussion about data would get us somewhere that we would be able, like by, by the system of rubrics or otherwise, again, there's, there's people who, are, uh, who, who, who know about assessment, how to uh, develop uh, tools for assessment of, 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 of student learning uh, much better that would probably, again, if we only had time and money, we could probably have meaningful discussion about how to make it work. Portfolio could be one, one, one of the examples and you're absolutely right. It sounds scary right away because it's qualitative, it's murky, it's difficult to attest, attest to. At the same time, we have a grading system and we seem to be okay with that. How murky is that? I mean, that's probably as, as, as murky as it gets, but you know, that's, that gets us to this bottom line uh, uh, number. Um, Natasha, Brian, uh, Cheryl, any, any, any thoughts on, on, on the data of assessment of student learning? I'll just share that I've been throwing links into the chat <laughs> as we've been Thank talking. You. And I was just typing up a response to Brian's question and I, I'll stop um, with before I throw the link in about like how much portfolio assessment is going. So I think part of the problem that we run into with the data is that we're stuck in this situation between some stakeholders that really want comparable information and want learning complex drilled down into these very like clear set of metrics and then others that are like it's this whole range of stuff that's going on and so that's where you see things like a portfolio assessment that says well you can look across and see this learning and i think it's also what the the value project led by aac and you the the valid achievement of learning and undergraduate education was trying to do is to say okay if we can create rubrics that you can use across institution to look at a wide variety of ways that students do this can we still get that sort of desired number piece um, that, that we have within some stakeholders? And I think the answer is we're never gonna get there because what we, and I think we should just give up that, that dream. So when we would have conversations with the National Institute with policymakers, they would be like, I want to know, do students learn better at this institution or that one? We'd be like, I don't know, it depends. Like what student wants the program and when do they come in? And like, what are they trying to do? And what did they do before that? And like all these questions, they have no time for that. <laughs> it's just, I want to know and tell me, and how can we sort of get that? Because back to the point about money, I want to know who to give my money to. And I think part, and we have, the short answer I'll do to this is we haven't tried to change that narrative. We haven't tried to change the narrative away from that it's about performance that you should define funds. That instead, <laughs> there are other ways to think about funding structures and how we need to get into that conversation and what we incentivize and what we reward. Um, we have, as a field sort of adapted to trying to find piecemeal solutional data that temporarily appease these requests. And that ends up with where we have a ton of data that no one knows what to do with, but we trot it out in an infographic when asked and we you know, put it on a website to try to make our case about something. And yet we're still then like, well, what did that have to do with learning? And did that actually help anybody out? The answer is no, that's not actually what we were going for in, in that space. And so I think, um, the more that we can try to pause our knee-jerk reaction of well, we'll just put something together to put a band-aid on it and start to get to some of Brian's system thinking points that he raised of like, no, we got to stop and rethink. If we flip this, what kind of data we collect? Where would it come from? How would we want to talk about it? What's the role of qualitative in this? How do we need to have a blended understanding to, to really get to some of the answers on this? And what do we need as the role of policymakers supporting us? And where do we need them to just stay out of? Um, in this space and how do we set that up and what data do we need to make the case around that? Maybe it's a very different conversation, but we're so, we don't have the time, the energy or the space to engage in that dialogue to really figure that out. So maybe an opportunity for this group to, to lead, the, lead the way there. Well, thank you, Natasha. Um, yes, we are certainly up to the task. <laughs> we, are, we are all there and I tell you, if I can help it, we'll certainly have the discussions uh, continue. 
but but again, it's the the picture that you're 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 painting, and uh, considering what 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 Brian said about you know time and money, then uh, system success versus student success, and then qualitative versus quantitative, it really is a huge task. It really we are we are talking about restructuring or at least you know re-looking perhaps revisiting the system of higher education as we know it and 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 it's just it's just tremendous so uh, if 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 you were to uh, perhaps uh set the tone here what do you think is a holy grail of this then assessment of student learning meaning what exactly right i mean again i'm you know to be honest i don't know if if you have an answer to for, to, to to that question because um, I'm, I'm asking about something that's very, very specific that, that you know, actually is not even clear in my mind. Uh, but I think that's, that's what we could probably do, just, just, just really for lack of a better uh, description here, we do need to have some kind of a uh, roundtable discussion and, and, and really put our minds together and, and figure this out, what's necessary, what the next step needs to be. And that's actually you know, going to be a topic of our conversation if we ever get there to the, to the, in the, the last slide in this, in this discussion is going to be about the future. So we can probably go back to this. Brian, please. Well, if the, if the last slide is going to be the future, I'll, I'll hold back on my futurist's answer to your holy grail question. Um, I did want to throw in one key issue, which I, I don't think we've touched on so far, because we've been moving so fast and covering so much. Um, and that's the uh, divide between the uh, quantitative and qualitative systems. I don't mean in assessment, I mean in curricula. That is the humanities versus the sciences. I mean, again and again, and I, you've all seen this more than I have. Uh, when I run into faculty objections to assessment, criticisms of assessment, it often comes from the humanities side. And it often comes down to a defense of qualitative against quantitative analysis or reasoning. Um, and I think that's, that's actually, a, it, it's kind of trivial to say this, it's pretty obvious. But I wanna make sure that we had this in mind that you know, in a lot of quantitatively intensive fields, uh, in chemistry, for example, uh, teaching to a certification exam just makes sense. Uh, think about the many, many certificates in computer science, for example. Uh, but it's harder and harder to do that in the less quantitatively demanding fields. Uh, you know, you have to kind of squeak it out in fields like second language acquisition, where you have uh, some you know, exams that, you, that people generally accept that test pretty well. And often those are things that we really can automate pretty well, uh, vocabulary, uh, verb formations. But you know, generally speaking, I think at the risk of a huge, huge abstraction, uh, I think you'll get the scientists on board more quickly than you will the historians. So, Brian, I don't know if you if if you realize that, but but I, I I tell you, it's as if you're reading my mind here because that's what I am after: uh, assessment of competency and skill attainment is not a purview of career education courses. I don't think, in a sense that. Um, you know what? I'll 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 get to it um, in in just a minute as well. But let me just. I believe I would like to make a point that English faculty will be able to tell you what is a well written essay, right? Just like nurses will tell you step by step what needs to be done when they look at their. Um, students' performance or, 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 or how they address the needs of the patient, right? So in other words, I think you, 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 are, you are absolutely right. The qualitative versus quantitative discussion is there because we framed it as such. But I, I would venture to say that really the discussion is on what it is that students learn regardless of the discipline. If, off the top of my head, because you, again, you just kind of like stole my thunder here without realizing that. That's oh, sorry. So I'm trying to address <laughs> that, rearticulating my thoughts. You know, <laughs> just. So... <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to step back from the, uh, from the from the from the mind reading. I'll, I'll step back here and no, uh, no, fix no, some no, other no. analysis. This, this is obviously not. No, no, you you couldn't have known that. So that's that's not. Uh, you know, that's 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 not the point. But what I'm trying to say is that. 
in order for us to communicate, we have to have certain skills. In order to perform daily life tasks, we have to have skills. And for whatever reason, we put academia, higher ed, specifically in this ivory tower of untouchable environment that's so remotely located from, from, from daily realities that we forget that, the relevance of learning to our life. So we'll, we'll touch up on this again. And Brian, again, as always, I'm, I'm just... Just, yeah, just, just so very grateful for your, I, for your thoughts. Please can I jump in a little in there because both what you said and speaking to what Brian had just said too. I mean, yes, yes. that what you just said, it gets right at another piece we haven't even tackled yet here, institutional learning outcomes or the general education learning outcomes, those overarching the core core curriculum, whatever it's called, you know, in the different continent systems and different schools that, you know, we do want students to come out with, or, you know, again, the AAUNC, AAUC, the value rubrics, all of the core learning that we expect somebody to come out, you know, and, I don't, uh, sorry, I don't know the, the uh, community college system as well. So, but I, I'm presuming too with the AA degree as well as the, the, a bachelor's degree, but, um, and, and that gets at some of that also the learning assessment across, right? Different programs and across the humanities and the sciences. And, and, and so that's another just the sort of piece that um, coordinating that as well across the institution, across multiple programs. Um, and that's a, another piece of that integrated assessment, the way the way I'm thinking of the term integrated assessment, which I'm going to try to collect a little bit more information about whatever, how everyone's using that term out there, because I know it's used differently. But um, I just sort of wanted to speak to that because I, I thought, you know, that's very relevant as well. So, absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for, for, for these comments. Yes, Cheryl, go, go right ahead. I think I want to chime in on, on my wish list of what preparation folks would need to become effective teachers. Mm -hmm. um, we've already talked, you know, more more um, about pedagogy and teaching and assessment, but I think here's another piece that unfortunately that that um, schism between humanities and sciences, it we we we're responsible for that. Why aren't we doing more mixed methodology research in our different disciplines? I see it a little bit in some of the folks I know in chemistry. They talk more occasionally in qualitative concepts, uh, but you know. I walk into my English department and and we're really only wanting to talk about qualitative approaches. And so, you know, in undergrad preparation and graduate preparation, you know, what could we be doing, I think, is a, is a great question uh, to, to better prepare folks to do research across the methodologies uh, that we're getting stuck in in one and then having to rely on that. And we see it when we want faculty to talk about data on our colleges, whether it's talking about equity data or learning data or outcomes data. You know, they're going to talk about it in the method that they are most familiar with. And so who is often engaged in those quantitative conversations are STEM folks who's engaged in, you know, occasionally if there's actually the opportunity for a qualitative conversation, we might get our, our uh, behavioral science and our um, humanities folks in there. But, you know, really thinking about preparation, uh, we need to, do, I think, a little bit more to help folks talk data and research and methodologies. Yeah, sure, I, I just wanna, yeah, yeah. So sorry, yeah, sorry. I, I can't find my raise hand icon or just go to. Um, I love this conversation and I put it in the chat too, but I've had this fantastic opportunity to um co-lead a, a faculty inquiry group, and it's on um equity and grading and mastery-based grading and skills-based grading and just all of that that encompasses. And it's made up in equal parts. We have child development, we've got English faculty, we've got math, chemistry, biology, flight science. And so as we talk through this new approach to assessment, and, and a lot of us are much more heavily into looking at skills-based and mastery-based grading, but we bring in the ungrading and contract grading and all that type of thing. But by sharing our disciplines and really forcing each other to take off that defensive, well, you're not a math faculty, you don't get what I have to do. And that's been a, a constant challenge that we do with one another. And, and because we we focused on this inquiry model with one another, we've been able to take off those blinders and say, no, let us share openly about what we do and challenge one another about, but do you have to do that? And um, I don't know how many times somebody has said it to me and I've said it to a colleague of, but why do you have to do it that way? And by looking, opening up our, our whatever the, the adage goes of lifting up the, the curtain of our individual disciplines and being able to say, this is how I do it, this is how you do it. And, and this actively challenging one another, we've been able to form such richer assessments across all these disciplines and really get to 
assessing that learning. And again, we're focusing a lot on the skills um, aspect of it, but I mean, we have these fantastic outcomes that we're seeing for our students. So I, I just wanted to share that. It's, it's, been, it's been so cool. Absolutely right, right on Amanda. That's 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 exactly right. Faculty inquiry groups, making sure that we again, Michelle is echoing your 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 thoughts here, breaking down the silos, right? And I really would like to go back to to uh, Brian's comment about history. I I I agree. History is losing enrollment, but if you were to think about it, isn't history something? Or let me just phrase it, maybe a skill to analyze history, right? Or, 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 or skill of historical analysis. Isn't it something that we need in today's society? I mean, how, how many times do we have to repeat that history happens and we never learn anything from it? Isn't it time for us to kind of like put stop to it by introducing elements of historical analysis and perhaps not only in history courses? So again, going back to, uh, I believe what, what Brian and Natasha alluded to, is, is really looking at what it is that we need to be doing within our system so that it's not just history class, but what you really get out of this. I, I believe that's, that's the link that, that we are not, not articulating very well. So again, Brian and, and Natasha, thank you very much. And Amanda, this is just just fantastic summary of this. Um, Mark, can I pick up on a great point please, that you please. just made at the end of that? So you've made several, but I want to grab that one. <laughs> so part of this is thinking about most of our, let's just take a history course as an example, was built around content. So I have to cover a certain amount of content. It's a survey course. I need to cover this amount of history. It wasn't about teaching historical skills or historical analysis or even an introduction to the discipline. But what does it mean to think like a historian? And if we flip, so when you think about like what it, what would happen or what would our data look like or what would this be differently if we led with some of those student learning outcomes? And if we're saying, okay, part of education is to produce democratic citizens and democratic citizens need to have an understanding of history and be able to critically engage with it, then our history course becomes preparing you to be able to critically engage with history and it would look fundamentally different and we might not have the same sort of situational enrollments of like well i could just search this up online and learn about what happened in this time period and watch some youtube videos like why do i need to take a course on this uh difference in situation um but the way that we talk about and uh what content we want to impart versus what we want people to learn through that content gets lost in the fray. And so I just wanted to elevate that at that point because I thought it was such a great one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. Enrique, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this slide, you know, talking about resources specifically. Uh, the question I have is, you know, at the community college or at the um, chancellor's office, what about learning in institutes, centers, where you have, a collaboration of the institutional research office, guided pathways, the equity, the SLO coordinators. The, I mean, like Amanda mentioned, all of the above. Uh, having the adjunct faculty, full time faculty, new faculty, learning, having the resources tied to the chancellor's office. And I want to say resources. Um, how can we don't, you know, uh, fund those resources or centers. That's the great, that's the, to me, that's the greater question. Right, I, I, I agree, Enrique, that's that's something that, that's absolutely mandatory at this point, I imagine. And, and again, uh, Amanda described the faculty inquiry group that, 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 that she's engaged in. I, I agree, I think those, those uh, entities should, uh, as, as Brian mentioned earlier, originate from this bottom-up effort, I suppose. Uh, again, this this has to come from faculty if we have time and money, right, for, for this to make it happen. But but if it does, if it should, then let's go ahead and make it happen. Uh, again, this idea of a roundtable discussion. Let's get together, figure this out. That's that's what we are after. So, so absolutely, Enrique, uh, uh, spot on. Uh, Amanda, um, there is oh, and someone uh, Leslie Leslie mentioned uh, non credit. If sure they weren't, I I, I apologize if, if there was someone else who mentioned it before her. Just just again, just just so that we kind of like acknowledge this comment here. 
uh, non-credit is a, uh, an, an entity that, that, that is a concept that, that does exist in community colleges uh, system. And uh, it really kind of like, by definition, flips the whole concept of learning upside down, that students who attend non-credit courses are not there because they are going to get a cert specific certificate. They are there to attain specific skills. Uh, it's an open entry, open exit system. If When students feel that they are done, they are done. They just simply leave. That's the concept that, again, Competency-Based Education Network is, is articulating quite well for, for higher ed. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Amanda, could we please move on to the next slide? And this is the part about accountability. And uh, the reason I would like to bring it up is, is uh, simply because our accrediting body and, and uh, uh, WASC is not far behind uh, ACCGC. Uh, and let me just, I, I don't wanna necessarily discuss the uh, relationship here or what accrediting bodies do, but we know, we know what they do and, and, and this is what they demand, that the institution defines and assesses student learning outcomes for all instructional programs and student and learning support services. And that's what we do at the accreditation times, you know that our co colleges are, are buzzing with, with activity, making sure that all of this is there. But Amanda, if you could please uh, click on, that, on, the, on the link that I just posted there so that, so that we can kind of like take a look at uh, what it is that's happening in the world outside of academia. You, you know, um, actually um could okay, i the could second I one or the first screen? one yeah i'll stop share please okay. be easier. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much and let me see so it's going to be right here can everybody see my screen can you see my screen that's yeah. the uh, yeah. Skills yeah. Yeah. yeah we can Excellent, super, thank you very much. So the reason I would like to bring it up is because uh, we are talking in, about enrollment and I think I do have a one, sli one slide about this, but as far as our accountability is concerned, look where our discussions are. And this is one of those uh, slides that Amanda, I think uh, coined as, as you know, shock effect, right? That our, our discussions are just like we talked a few minutes ago, What's the difference between outcome and objective? How often do we assess them? Uh, what do I sell? What difference does it, do they make anyway? And in the meantime, this is a website from McDonald's, Skills and Education. This is a Walmart website, Walmart Academy. Take a look. They have their own college. They do. This is Chase Leadership Development Program. This is, uh, and, and then there is, what was it, Premier? And again, I, I, I started looking um, for those um, websites for different corporations and different employers out there uh, who specifically uh, address the need of students to bump their skills up so that they can offer them employment. And this college here, um, I landed on this website I, was, I believe I was checking out Toyota, I think, or Honda Motors, you know, one of those. And here they are. And finally, last but not least, obviously, there is the Google Career Certificates. You know, they, they take people off the street, literally, with really very little skill. I don't even think they require high school diploma. And they coach them and they tell them what they need to be able to do to fulfill the the job requirements and then at the end of the day when they are successful if they are successful they are offered a job at google and who wouldn't want to work at google right so so again the the question here is why is the gap so wide why is it that we are focused on accountability measures that really do not help students and we've been you know again we we talk about enrollment who knows? I, I honestly don't know. Maybe, maybe we could start discussion on this topic from that perspective. Where do our students go? Because, it, you know, as, as Brian mentioned, decline in enrollment was happening before COVID. And then we started saying, well, yeah, COVID did it because 
students had to go back to work and whatnot, life happens. But perhaps there is something more to be said about the role of entities that historically have not offered degrees, and here they are, filling in the gap. So what's going on? Is this, is this something that, that, that we are missing in our discussion and we, we are just being blindsided? We are, we are ignoring this? Or what's going on in the society at large? Who is attracting our students and for what reasons? Better marketing, their messages reaching them, you know, like, hey, you can get what you need in a concise way. Although as I was saying that, I realized that's kind of where the, uh, the push with the for-profits when they started to really boom was sort of that too. Like, hey, you know, come to us. Well, you know, but, um, you know, which then that's another factor that pushed us more toward assessment, by the way, too, is that accountability because of the proliferation and the really success of uh, enrollments in the for-profits. That's another piece, but I'm just thinking like that was another factor um, in that. But I don't know, I'm thinking, you know, there's something uh, uh, someone said earlier, I think Natasha or as a few of us spoke to it, maybe that this idea of um, really, are we really meeting the students' needs? You know, really, and, and I think some of these maybe are speaking, whether they're really truly doing it, but they're at least selling a message that says, hey, we know what, we know what you're looking for and we can deliver it better, maybe cheaper, maybe quicker, things like that, that's my guess. I'll throw out some work that we did with employers in conversations on this with the Chamber of Commerce and the Manufacturing Institute in some of the space. And I would caution that I'm not sure most of these programs have students' best interest at heart. <laughs> so that the employer driven things really become about can, how can I find and source my talent? And how can I reskill and upskill the talent I have internally? And if I'm not getting good signals from other things, because I'm not sure what that is, it's a lot cheaper and faster for me to find that talent, obtain an upskill um, or retrain to have my own. And some employer training that was happening before we didn't see because we wouldn't be have the, there was no functional means by which to give certificates so to, or to then promote it and say okay you know you already have a degree in something else but now you want to come and do this we'll take the liberal arts skills that you have under it and that'll be great but we can build on the skills that you need to understand how to use and interface with our technology um, so in some ways i'm not sure how much of this is like if we can't keep up in education with the changing nature of what's going on within an industry, is that the industry's responsibility to say, you handle the basics, we'll teach them the on the ground pieces that they know, and that this is actually something that you need to think about as a layer in a partnership um, of, all right, we'll get the student ready. And then now you're prepared to take these certificates and then go into a job. And so it actually becomes a part of our pathway, or if it's a reshaping and stepping into to a skills economy and i'm not sure and i will say this that i don't see it the reason we were doing this with the chamber of commerce on things is that most medium and small businesses have no means by which to move into a skills-based hiring process that's why we don't see the uptake so if you're a giant like amazon like you can do whatever you want and you're going to have an impact on the ecosystem if you're walmart which is like in most states the number one employer in the state like you're gonna have a huge impact on that ecosystem but where most of our students go that are place-based and do this and think about like career trajectory and path we don't have the mechanisms to pivot to us they don't have to take intake for skills based hiring and engage in that way and so even if we switched i'm not sure how that mismatch goes but i don't know how much of this is like the hiccup in a system before it gets itself worked out and then starts chugging along in a different manner and and how much of this is some other situations so i think it's fascinating to watch and i think it's assessed with people it is part of our due diligence to to keep abreast of the things that are going on here and be in conversations about like, well, how do you know? And what are you doing? And what kind of evidence are you including in that that can form our conversations? Um, but it's again, it's one of those things where I don't know, this ecosystem is a crazy one, but it's worth it's worth conversations about for sure. Right. It just seems that you know those those entities pop up and they just don't take they don't ask permission, right? They they don't take prisoners. This is it right here. Hey, guess what? We have enough money, we have enough time to train students who happen to be at pretty much any any time in, in, in their lives. Amanda, would you like to um, speak a little bit about the Title V, please, if you don't mind? Oh, I, sure. I yeah, sure. Um, so a couple of years ago, we wrote a, uh, a Title V grant, and it was when 
uh, and still is work-based learning and applied learning kind of was it was a big push and so the grant focused on applying those concepts in a humanities type courses and so the conversation has been really interesting and neat to have with faculty on making those connections in their courses so an example is we have um, an english faculty who started a, a publication with the students and it's a, a homegrown um uh, newsletter, not even newsletter, but it's like a, a magazine that sources the articles from the students, they publish it, they um, print it, and they send it all out. And, um, and the skill attainment and the mastery of the course outcomes is evaluated in the context of that model. And so they're creating a, a newspaper that the exact word is escaping me. It's not a newspaper, it's not a newsletter, it's, it's, it's a something else, um, but they're distributing that out, coming up with the articles um, to be able to, to send out. And same thing with um, like sociology, they're going out into the field um, and um, oh, I can't remember that example, but there's we have some that are working in the Chamber of Commerce and um, working with um, the, our local chamber, chamber of Commerce and getting their skills in certain classes assessed within the context of that work. Um, so I know that was kind of a roundabout, very cloud-based explanation, um, but the, the focus is on faculty looking in this humanities class on what is the, the careers or the work that students are interested in and assessing the skills and the outcomes of those class in that context. So they're grading, they're getting that hands-on experience in a humanities course. So acknowledging that I don't have to just teach my English, basic English class on here, write an essay on something that you don't care about, but here you're interested in publication of um, newsletters or whatever it might be why don't you go do that and i'm going to assess the skills in that context so that's what the title five grant is, is supporting so what i'm hearing is like more engaged learning right hand mm -hmm. like you said hands-on applied context-based um yeah i mean and that's again getting back to kind of pedagogy and, and helping faculty think about different ways that the learning can happen that really engages students and gets them excited and like someone said earlier we don't want to kill the excitement for learning. And those are the, yeah, um, the different engaged. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely, yeah. fantastic work, Amanda. Thank you very much for sharing. That's it, uh, uh, Brian, uh, would you mind um, addressing this so that we can move on? Uh, what's, 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 what, are, what are your, your speakers telling you about the intrusion of, of, of uh, other entities into the sphere of higher ed? If, if you could uh, comment on this too, again, put it for us in a, in a, in a bigger perspective? Oh, it's fascinating. It depends in part on the country um, and on the region. So for example, if you take a look at the European Union, there's a lot of European Union slash European Commission efforts to try to create standards um, and different countries then kind of push their public universities in that direction. Um, you know, you've got accrediting agencies which are trying sometimes to be a little bit more active. Uh, you have really, um, uh, very proactive governments like uh, Turkey, China, India right now, where for different reasons, um, they're really pushing hard for uh, the universities to teach and focus and research on certain topics and in certain ways. Uh, in the US, it's a little different because American higher education is really disorganized. You know, we have about 4,000 colleges and universities, one third are private and therefore are basically autonomous. The two thirds that are, are public are state funded, but state funding is much lower than it used to be. Uh, we have state systems, so we have 50 of those. Uh, and even within the systems, there's all kinds of, of agita and trying to get things coordinated. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to see uh, all, that, all that pressure try to exert itself in a wide range of ways. Um, in countries where uh, we increasingly privatize higher education. The US is the leader in this. Uh, private funders and donors become very influential uh, for obvious reasons. And then uh, we have businesses who, uh, a, a business in higher education often go in a kind of pendulum relationship where uh, businesses try to teach as much as they can, you know, open their own campuses, train as much as they can, and then they aren't happy with the results, so they outsource it to higher ed. And this goes back and forth. And, and right now, we may be seeing more and more pressure from, uh, from businesses to try to get higher ed to produce graduates who are more amenable to their business needs. And in some cases, this is very benign and part of the normal system. 
Think, for example, about the largest sector in higher education in the United States, the community college system, which is intensely bound up with the local economies. Um, and in some cases, of course, it is maligned. Um, but then we also have the uh, additional challenge that uh, because the finances of higher education in the U.S. are so strange, uh, you know, our tuition rates keep shooting up, our discount rates are shooting up right now. We just learned from the Kubo that our discount rate for first year students is about 54.5%. Uh, that is to say the kind of median student pays about half. And then we have the terrible bolus of student debt, you know, which is around $1.7 trillion. So we have a lot of, you know, a lot of businesses that are trying to intervene and offer to help and the word to compete. Uh, they're, they're not really good at competition. Uh, you know, the four as part of this it really, really collapsed badly under the Obama administration. Uh, the Trump administration tried to resuscitate them and they're still pretty weak. Um, but I, I think we'll keep seeing uh, all kinds of external actors, uh, governments, funders, foundations, businesses, continue to keep poking and prodding us uh, in order to try to improve what we do by their lights. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Again, the, the, the bigger we think, the more complex it gets, obviously, right? And here we go. So I think, Amanda, for the because we are almost at, at, at the top of the hour here, would you mind please sharing our, our last slide? I don't think we, we have a chance to, uh, to talk much about it. In, in the slide deck, I, I do have one slide titled Future, and I intentionally left it blank because I would like to hear our panelists what they think, again, going back to this question of the Holy Grail, uh, what it should be, what it could be, what in the world are we doing now? We're, we're, what is the direction that we need to be taking? Um, we, are, we are all ears. Uh, Michelle, uh, from, from your perspective, where, where do you think we could, we could and, and again, from Cal State, uh, system that you're representing is, is uh, you know, as is, is, is Brian mentioned, we are educating a lot of students, right? What could we do differently? <laughs> you had to throw it to me first. <laughs> Please, if you don't mind. Sorry, sorry. I just, I just oh, happened gosh. to be, yeah. It's a tough one. Um, the Holy Grail. When you said it earlier, even I thought, okay, wait, you gotta think. Wow. Um, I, I am optimistic about the efforts and the prodding along and the developing, you know, the systems like as I'm sure, you know, many coordinators in the room are doing just like at the at the CSUs also where we've got the distributed model we've got assessment committees of faculty who are working, you know, we have our annual uh, student learning outcomes assessment reports from the at the program level and that of course builds um, on the really to the accreditation ultimately this you know program academic program. Um, review and so you know that that exists but but has really been sort of a little engine that could I feel like for many 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 years again accreditation has been there we've had to do it but I do feel like I've seen it uh, I was at Cal State LA before Dominguez Hills too and in both institutions I've seen really like we're building buy-in I think from more folks more faculty they are getting it and so in terms of the um, keep chugging along and building it better into the reward structure I think and the Compensation structure is an important piece always for folks because everybody, like I said earlier, is working really, really hard and overtaxed on, on every level, staff and faculty. And, you know, um, yeah, so that's I'm optimistic. I don't know about the Holy Grail. I don't know if there's one Holy Grail, but I'll just right, stop there. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, but, you know, Michelle, you're, that's again, you're, you're addressing the issue of faculty. And again, this is exactly what I get from, from, the, from, from faculty leaders that I, that I speak on you know, campus and, 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 and otherwise is, is, is uh, you're, you're right. People are stretched thin. That, that's, that's, that's just that. There's again, the, as, as Brian mentioned earlier, time and money, right? Mm -hmm. There is, you know, people don't even need the uh, release time anymore. We just, we, you just, there's just so much to do that, yeah. that really there is, there is this fear of, of constant um, burnout. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's what we are after. So again, yeah. as probably Brian would attest to this, restructuring of the system or looking at it differently. Yeah, it's just totally. much bigger project because, that we can tackle. Go ahead, sorry. Right, we can get like, um, 
short-term grants and things to help support these and to build it, but we know that the net, you know, that really should just be to launch it to then be institutionalized. And a lot of times I think institutions just rely on one grant to the next grant to the next grant and not really doing what really the intention, you know, especially in the assessment space and building capacity uh, across the institution really is about integrating it into the whole business processes and, and, and that has to be part of the in compensation structure and so forth for everybody. So. Or Thank more, you very more much. positions, more positions for the capacity as well in IR and assessment across uh, academic affairs and student affairs and so forth. Okay, I'll stop. Absolutely. Natasha, would you I, like to go next? Cheryl, actually, go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in because Michelle went in a direction that I was thinking as well, that it's really about resource. You know, as systems, we're trying to do as much as we can with uh, depleting resources. And, you know, we do, we rely on these short-term funding solutions to do amazing things in small spaces. You know, some of Amanda's examples and others that have been put into the chat are great examples of that. But as grants run out, faculty sitting at the table change over time, uh, we don't get enough time to have those conversations with other colleges and other systems to share those good works often enough. Or if we do, there's not enough time in our daily schedule and all the demands we juggle, particularly as faculty, to, to reach into those spaces and engage, um, you know, as regularly as so many people in this space have, fortunately. And so I think it's just finding ways to resource and then really using budgets as a sign of you know, making this conversation and, and the evaluation of student learning and the professional development, not professional development, professional learning and, and collaboration that is necessary, making that a priority in our budgets rather than figuring out, you know, what other uh, item needs to be funded and, and thinking about learning in, in the last part of that uh, conversation. So I think resource is huge, but, you know, then it's not just the money. It's what structures can we build to help to, to you know, reform our system. You know, it, we know that's not easy either. And I like professional learning. I'll, I'll, I'll do some research on the term. Really appreciate this. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, Natasha, would you like to uh, speak to this next? Sure. And thank you, Michelle and Cheryl, for carrying the <laughs> kicking us off on, on that part. I'm going to say that I, I'm not going to call out a holy grail because I think we're going to create it together in, in where this, this future space is. And, and I hope we do. I hope this is something that we create together and it is a space that we want to be in, that we find ourselves in, and not a space that is we, we are having to figure out how to exist and adapt within um, in, in that space. And so for me, what I wanna put out here is sort of a, a call to the assessment professionals and anyone doing this work that, that you are uniquely positioned. You sit in such a great spot that is across the view that you have of learning, of students, of the systems, all of that is so unique. And we put so much on the back of our faculty and staff that they right now cannot carry. They just can't. Um, and not that they could before, but it's pushed to a breaking point at this point. And so we need to rethink who our partners are, where, how we humanize our work. And I cannot talk enough about the strength of getting students as our allies in it. When I think about how do we create this, we're not gonna create it by uh, pushing our overburdened faculty to try to do more. We're not gonna do this with our staff that's been shrinking and our student affairs people that are flipping like crazy and leaving in all these regards. We need to think differently about who can be an agent of change and what our levers are to help us get there. And because we have that view of data, because we see those connection points differently, I think thinking very strategically about when we employ which students and what voices in which spaces and who we bring with us to meetings and who we think in those spots, all of that can be such a game changer and help alleviate our stress and that issue, but also for the needs for our students who feel detached, disengaged, and without agency. And what better way to reach them than inviting them to co-create a better space with us as well. And I think it's really hard for policymakers when people in their district are talking about like votes that are coming to this that are the people that we're trying to build these systems for. And so I, I wanted to say we're tired. Let's not engage in systems change without the people that use them the most. Um, but we got this assessment folks. Like, there's nobody else that sees things the way that you do. And that's a strength. And so don't see it otherwise, please. It's a good thing. Right, 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 right. And I think that, uh, yeah, student stories. Leslie, fantastic suggestion. Absolutely. Natasha, this is, that's what it is. It, it, you know, again, going back to what Brian said earlier about this bottom up approach. Uh, Brian, the, this is your, your last word. If you don't mind, please. Sure. Um, well, first, first, let me just thank everybody for uh, a great conversation. I really appreciate the chance to learn from all of you and to bounce ideas around and uh, to fill up my browser tabs. Uh, I, I've really, really appreciated this. Let me, as as the panel's token futurist, let me look ahead a little bit. 
uh, in the short term, it seems that we're going to see all of these institutional and political pressures to improve assessment. Um, Ill-funded uh, and running into the complicated uh, ecosystem I mentioned before, but there's a lot of pressure for this. Um, and that meets all kinds of friction, which all of you are familiar with. I think we'll just keep seeing this and keep leaning on this for the near term. Uh, but in the a little bit beyond that, I'd like to turn to technology a bit. Uh, I think the medium term, say the next decade, uh, we're likely to see more and more technological tools that come to bear, that come to bear for assessment. And I don't just mean, say, uh, exam proctoring or, um, or data analytics. I mean, a little further than that. Uh, think, for example, about uh, learning apps like uh, Duolingo on mobile phones. And think about how they can be easily embedded into the rest of your daily life. So, for example, I mean, I'm studying Spanish on Duolingo right now. Uh, it would be trivial for uh, the app to listen to the spoken language around me. And if it detects any Spanish, to record it and play it back to me uh, as a quiz. Um, and Duolingo does a ton of assessment, just continuous daily assessment. Uh, imagine doing this with a bit of AI. I mean, not start, not science fiction AI, but just the kind of AI we're working with right now, where it can prompt me, where it can give me quizzes on the fly. And if I'm learning history, if I'm learning biology, if I'm learning uh, semantic theory, that uh, the AI can nudge me and offer me more ways to respond. That's just the medium term. I think if we look at the long term, one of the great holy grails that we have to keep an eye out for is simply the science of brain measuring. Uh, where every year we get better and better at coming up with ever more finely greened uh, details about what the brain is thinking. Um, I think if we look, say, 15 years out, I would not be surprised to see uh, early signs of such a holy grail where we can tell, all right, just how much is Natasha aware of when it comes to her Chinese language class? Uh, or just how little does Brian actually remember from his Byzantine history class? Um, I think that's the holy grail. Holy Grails have the virtue that we don't necessarily attain them, but in our effort to try and get that way or to think about them, that unleashes a whole bunch of creativity. So that's a glimpse ahead from your panel's futurist. Fascinating. Wow. I'm just, I'm just so happy that we had this discussion. What can I say? Just, just words of gratitude. Everyone, I really, really, really appreciate uh, your, your insights and the time. Look, we spent two hours and it just went, they just went by. And I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for two more. <laughs> it's just been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much, uh, Michelle, Cheryl, Natasha, Brian. Just so, so grateful for, for your time and sharing of your expertise. Just, just fascinating. So again, the, the, the video is going to be uh, made available. Uh, my, my colleagues, coordinators, um, Amanda, Enrique, uh, Grace, you. you've heard from them. We do have space. We just need time. Let's get going on, on our work. And, and as you can see, there's just, just a lot of it. So thank you so much for, for participating. And hey, guess what? We will follow Natasha's lead. We'll call on you. Don't worry. We know where to find you now, and we know we can count on you. So <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we, I'm, I'm, I'm sure our, our paths are going to, to, to cross in near future. Thank you very much, everyone. Until next yeah. time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much.